Yo, good morning, everybody. I'm so glad to be able to be before you in this third installment of our sermon series entitled Do the Right Thing. Of course, it is a take off on the uh, Spike Lee joint, uh, the Spike Lee made uh, almost, what is it, about 30 years ago. And we've been endeavoring to leverage that title to push Christians as it relates to these matters of social justice and matters of race to do the right thing. So today we're going to kick off our third installment, and today's sermon is, is entitled Dear Evangelicals. Um, now just a quick word about that word evangelicals that I'm using. Uh, some people might ask, like, who is an evangelical? Does that include me? The word evangelical is a broad term that is used to identify people who are born again, right? Who, when they think about their religion, they think about it in terms of a salvific experience. So um, once I was lost and then I was found, and so I have been born again. Uh, and so uh, many of us identify as evangelicals. I identify as an evangelical. Again, it is those that believe that they have been born again, those that believe that their salvation is through grace alone, through faith alone. So when you really start to look at it, it includes many of the denominations and um, uh, sects of Protestant Christianity within America. Um, I'm going to be speaking to that group today. So when I say that group, I am absolutely talking about City Point, uh, but I'm talking about a broader group. I'm talking about uh, evangelicals around the country that has uh, tended to move in a way that I have a critique on that I want to share today, uh, and in a way that I, I absolutely truly believe that God is critiquing. And so we're going to jump right into it. I'm going to be looking at Acts chapter 9. Um, we're going to start reading at verse 1. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. It says, meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest, he requested letters, uh, he requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way that he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the vo voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Verse 7 says, the men with Saul stood speechless. for They heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Let us pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, thank you so much for the chance to deliver your word today. I pray that you will speak through me with power, with courage, and with conviction in the way that your people need to hear it. I pray, God, that you will simply use me as your vessel to deliver your word. Pray that you will get the glory out of all of it, and we truly will make your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the 2018 NBA Finals, there is an infamous incident where J.R. Smith of the Cleveland Cavaliers gets an offensive rebound when the game is tied with only a few seconds left to go in the game. But rather than call a timeout, rather than shoot the ball, rather than even passing the ball to a teammate who could have taken a shot to potentially win the game, instead, J.R. dribbles the ball away from the rim toward the half-court line, and he allows the game clock to just run out. This incident, which is infamous in J.R. Smith's career, he's never been able to live it down. And the incident can simply be summed up this way. With the game on the line, J.R. was running the wrong way. I want to speak to the evangelical community this morning to the general masses of people and leaders in churches across America. I want to say to the evangelical community that the game is on the line and many of us 
are running the wrong way. In the midst of what could go down in history as the greatest movement for civil rights and social justice of the 21st century, many evangelicals are simply running the wrong way. Because I want to submit to you today that to be anti-justice is to be anti-Jesus. I want to submit to you today that being against freedom and equality and equity and an end to oppression is against Christ. I want to submit to you that guarding the systems of oppression and protecting privilege with the gospel is actually antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to submit to you today in short that the game is on the line and you are running the wrong way. The reality of going the wrong way, this reality of going the wrong way is present in the life of the man that we have come to know as the Apostle Paul. At this time, he is known as Saul, and he is not a convert to Christianity. No, he is a follower of Judaism. He is not a Jew simply by religious relief. No, it is much more than that for him and many others. It's a way of life. It's a heritage. It's a culture. It's a nationalism. It's national pride. To be a Jew in Saul's time, it was like being a Christian in some parts of America today. Where to be Christian is to be Eurocentric no matter what your background. It's to be patriotic. It is to be pro-military and pro-gun and pro-capitalism and pro-American exceptionalism. It is not just religion. It is a deep culture. So steeped in this culture was Saul that when a new movement was afoot, his religion and his cultural zeal just got the best of him. Uh, there was this new movement that was going on, this thing called the way that we have come to know as Christianity, and Saul, a worshiper of God, saw this new thing called Christianity not as a thing of the light, but of darkness. Yeah, Saul, a follower of God, a servant of God, he was so opposed to the movement that he thought it was his God-given mission to not only kill the movement, but to kill the people inside of the movement. He went on and he got letters from the high priests that were addressed to the Jewish synagogues in Damascus, and it was effectively asking for their cooperation that they would help Paul identify who were the Jews that had converted to Christianity or this new movement called the Way so that Paul could arrest them and take them back in chains to Jerusalem. So it's while Paul who at this time is known as Saul, is on his way to do this. It is, on, it is while he is on his way with religious zeal in his heart and letters in his hand, that Saul starts on this road to Damascus. But while he is on the way, he gets confronted by the one who is the way, truth, and the life to tell him that he is going the wrong way. On the road, a light shines. It blinded Saul. He heard a voice ask the question, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul was trembling in fear and he replied back to this voice that he heard, who are you, Lord? To which that voice replied back, I am Jesus, the one who you are persecuting. Now get up, go to the city, and I got a new mission for you. On that road to Damascus, Saul experiences something. Uh, on that road to Damascus, Saul's life is altered. It is on that road to Damascus that Paul, Paul's religion is confronted by the Redeemer. It is on that road to Damascus that Saul is confronted with the fact that you can be extra religious and extra wrong at the same time. It is on that road to Damascus that Saul discovered that the God whom he thought he was fighting for, he was actually fighting against. So I want to deliver to you a prophetic word this morning to Christians all over this country who think that they are 
fighting for God by fighting against the social justice warriors. I want to talk to those who think that they are protecting God by protecting the status quo. I want to talk to those who have been fed the lie that the gospel is all about personal salvation and not social salvation. And my message to you today is, dear evangelicals, you need a Damascus Road experience where the Christ of your construct meets the true Christ of Christianity. Let me say that again. My message to you today is, dear evangelicals, you need, like Saul, a Damascus Road experience where the Christ of your construct that you have created to maintain your systems of oppression meets the true Christ of Christianity. Dear, dear evangelicals, you, 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 you need a Damascus Road experience because what you are persecuting against, you should be participating with. That's the first thing I want to talk about. You need this experience because what you're persecuting against, you should be participating with. When we meet Saul, who would later become Paul, the book of Acts shows him as a person that is against the church. He is anti all things related to this new movement called Christianity. T take note of the fact that Acts is the fifth book of the New Testament. This same Saul who was persecuting the movement in chapter 9 would be building up the movement throughout all the rest of Acts. This same Saul who we meet trying to kill the movement, right, who we meet trying to tear down this movement in the fifth book of the New Testament would go on to write what we would come to know as the next 13 books of the New Testament after Acts. Yet what he was persecuting against, he is now participating with. Let me suggest to you that the Damascus Road will do that to you. The Damascus Road will straighten out crooked theology. The Damascus Road will realign you from what is simply defending culture and tradition and a way of life to actually defending the truth of the gospel. It will shift you from defending the loudest of these to defending the least of these that Jesus talked about. It will shift you from partnering your religion with the power structure to partnering your religion with the, plight, with the plight of the poor, the Damascus Road. Evangelicals need a Damascus Road experience because while many of them are anti-social justice and have cast it as ungodly, it's actually exactly what the word of God and the cross of Jesus Christ are all about. Let me take you back to the Old Testament. Psalm 82 and 3, it, the way that it reads in my Bible, not sure if it still reads this way in yours, but it says, give justice to the weak and the fatherless, maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. That is the word of God for the people of God. Isaiah 1 and 17, the way it reads in my Bible, not sure if it reads that way in yours, but it says, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless and plead the widow's cause. That is Isaiah 1 and 17, the word of God for the people of God. Micah 6 and 8, the way that it reads in my Bible is he has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. That is the word of God for the people of God. How did Jesus begin his ministry? When he finds himself in that synagogue, he goes into that synagogue and he opens up the scroll and he rolls it out to Isaiah 61. And what does it say there? The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to do what? Jesus, to proclaim good news to who? The poor. He has sent me to do what? Proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind and to do what? To set the oppressed free. When we examine the ministry of Jesus, wasn't it inherently and deeply social? Was not it aimed at the lifting up of the oppressed? Of, was it not aimed at the building up of the, those that were bound? Was it not about the marginalized and ministry to the least of these? When you look at the ministry of Jesus, look at how he engaged with that Samaritan woman at the well, despite the fact that she had been socially marginalized. 
Look at how he protected the woman that was caught in adultery from this extrajudicial murder that was about to happen because the people already had stones in their hands. Look at his ministry. Look at how he restored sight and mobility to the disabled. In the words of Stephen Matson, talking about Jesus, instead of saying all lives matter, Jesus said Samaritan lives matter. Instead of saying all lives matter, Jesus said children's lives matter. Instead of saying all lives matter, Jesus said Gentiles' lives matter. Instead of saying all lives matter, Jesus said specifically Jewish lives matter. Instead of saying all lives matter, Jesus said specifically through his actions and words that women's lives matter. Instead of saying all lives matter, Jesus said the ones that are untouchable, the outcasts of their society, the lepers. Jesus said that lepers' lives matter. Might I suggest to many evangelicals that what you are persecuting against, you should actually be participating with. While many pr claim to be pro-life, I want you to come and be pro-life with us when it comes to unarmed black men and women being gunned down by police if you really want to be pro-life. Be pro-life, but be pro-life by also not rejecting this very pro-life statement that black lives matter. You want to be pro-life. You want to be pro-life, but be pro-life by being pro-fair wages, by being pro-gun control, by being pro-ending mass incarceration, by being pro-ending the thing, the mass incarceration that has stolen the lives of hundreds of thousands of men and women. May I say secondly, dear evangelicals, you need a Damascus Road experience because your practice of religion has become reckless. Let me say that again, because your practice of religion has become reckless. Let's look at the text. Back at verse 1, it says, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest he requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way that he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. When I read the text, y'all, it left me with a couple of questions. One question mainly. When did Judaism become about jailing? E exactly what part of the religion is this? You, you know, I, I've studied a, a whole lot of Christian religion and Judaism. I, I have read through the Old Testament and the New Text Testament. I, I have preached probably at this point a thousand sermons that I have written out. I have done, um, I don't know how many maybe 10,000 hours uh, of studying of the Word of God, and, and I can't recall a place or a time where I find that Judaism is supposed to be about jailing people. Where in what book of the Old Testament did I miss the part about Judaism, about the people that are followers of God having included in their responsibility jailing folks and killing folks, in what way is it constructive? In what way does this honor God? Now, what it does to me is it speaks to a slippery slope of reckless religion. It speaks to a slippery slope of reckless religion. And I think that it's necessary, absolutely necessary, from time to time, for every Christian and every religious folks, folk, person to take a step back and check your religion to make sure that it hasn't become reckless. To my fellow evangelicals, I want to say this to you with love. Where some of the leaders and members within evangelicalism have taken the church down this road of Trumpism, of racism, of militarism, of white supremacy, it absolutely is reckless. 
The religion that you practice in person appears to be more about your hate for liberals than your love for the Lord. Let me say that again. The religion that many of you leaders practice in public seems to be more about your hate for liberals than your love for the Lord. Your public practice of religion to the layman's eye seems to be more about protecting capitalism, seems to be more about protecting greed, tends to be more about hedging in millionaires and billionaires, tends to be more about hedging in the oppressor, tends and seems to me to be more about protecting whiteness than it is about protecting the faith. When the group that claims to stand for morality can full-throatedly endorse a professed genital-grabbing, every other sentence lying, adultery with porn star committing, racist, xenophobic, and then the leaders try to watch their vote in the religion, let me say to you that your religion has become reckless. Your religion has become reckless. But now let me not labor the point too long because those who get it got it. Those who don't get it don't want to get it. So let me just push on with this thing. Let me suggest to you, dear evangelicals, you need a Damascus Road experience thoroughly and finally because your mission is misguided. Yes, Saul was deeply religious. Saul was trying to serve God. Saul was even following the lead of the respected religious leaders of his day. Saul ain't out there on some rogue mission, just out there by himself being reckless. No, he is following the tide of the time. He's got endorsement as he's going out to Damascus. He is not out there by himself. He's got endorsement from not just any old priest, but the high priest to go and take care of this business. Let me suggest to you that if anybody should be able to be trusted, it actually ought to be the religious leaders, the heads of religious universities, the pastors of the largest evangelical churches in America, the leaders whose books are on shelves, the people whose sermons have blessed us, the people who are all over Christian television, the people who are all over Christian radio. If anybody should be trusted, should be able to be trusted, it ought to be the religious leaders. Paul is out there on a mission, and his mission is sanctioned. Scholarship would even suggest fueled by the religious leaders that he respected. And Saul is out there trying to serve God. And Saul is out there trying to serve God with zeal. So while others are just out there talking about it, Saul is like, I'm going to be about it. So he's out there on a mission for God. But let me say to you that it's a misguided mission. Dear evangelicals, if your mission is anti-social justice, which for a whole lot of evangelicals it is, because I'm talking from the inside. I'm speaking today as an inside man. I've gotten the invitations to your conferences. I've gotten the invites to your webinars. I, I, I've seen the literature about being against social justice and calling it an affront to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know that works. If your mission is anti-justice, if your mission is about upholding white supremacist ideals regardless of how you cloak them, if it is against fairness and equity, if it is against government protecting the human dignity of black folks, if it's against protecting immigrants, if it's against human dignity for the LGBT community, let me say to you that it is a misguided mission. You need a Damascus Road experience. Let, let, me wrap, let me wrap this thing up with this closing illustration. One, one time, uh, my wife Carla and I, we were um, in the D.C. area, and we were uh, looking ahead back to Chicago. And, and unfortunately, um, I messed around and sent us to the wrong D.C. area airport. I sent us to the wrong D.C. area airport. And so we did the right thing. We 
hopped in the Uber with plenty of time and we're planning to get to the airport early and we'll have some time to eat some food once we get through security at the airport. And so we get all the way to the airport and realize that we have told the Uber driver to go to the wrong darn airport. And so very quickly, we call another Uber and we jump in the Uber and this Uber Uber is trying to take us away from where we are and take us to Reagan Airport. And by the time we get to Reagan, guess what happens? We've missed our flight because we went the wrong way. To my evangelicals, I say this. Just like me and Carla on that good vacation in D.C., Missed our flight. To many of my evangelical brothers and sisters, y'all are about to miss the flight. God is about to do a new thing. These brothers and sisters that you see in the street, this multicultural movement, this multiracial movement of people that are out in the street, putting their lives on the lines, their bodies on the line, their livelihood on the line. Not because they want anything special, they just want equal treatment. They want justice. They they want the stuff that God wanted that he spoke about through the prophets. And they're on the streets demanding that a government that, that, that right now is sanctioned and supported by a big old group of Christians. that They're out there petitioning that group to give us justice. Some are responding in the government, some are not responding in the government, but I pay attention to the, to the Twitter feeds. I, I pay attention to what, what folks are saying out in the social media sphere. I pay attention to what the evangelicals are saying and, and some are starting to turn the tide and some are starting to turn the corner and and get on track and see things for what they really are. But some are circling the wagon with the same old tricks. And as we round the basis in this new political season, some are up to the same old tricks. Let's convince Christians that the most important thing in the world to them right now is more conservative judges so we can tell women what to do with their bodies. That is the most important thing. The most important thing is protecting bathrooms so only certain people can go in certain bathrooms. They will trivialize to you as a Christian and will say that if you do not vote this way, you are voting against God. Let me tell you that God is not somewhere in heaven wringing his hands because... In America, two grown people can do what two grown people want to do in their bedroom. God is not wringing his hands about that. God is not in heaven wringing his hands about who can go in which bathroom. But Let me tell you, my reading of the Bible says that what does deeply trouble God is oppression. It's people calling what is evil good and good evil. It is injustice. It's these things. It is, it is, it is, it is, it is being against the immigrant and not welcoming to the immigrant. It is these things that deeply trouble God. This is the space that our faith needs to operate in. But too many of our brothers and sisters will remain on the wrong side of this fight on the Saul side of this fight rather than the Paul side of this fight because you have not yet had a Damascus Road experience. Let us pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, thank you for your word today. Thank you for pushing us. Thank you for challenging us to align ourselves with your word, to push past the lies within our faith that have been handed down to us from those that we respect. Some knowing and some unknowing. 
have leveraged this religion to protect the status quo, have wrapped the cross in an American flag and for some even in a Confederate flag. Lord, help us all to see that you are bigger than our politics and that most important is that we do justice, is that we create a fair and equitable society, and that we plead the case of those that are oppressed. Help us, O oh God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's praise God for his word. All right, what's going on, City Point? So we just heard an amazing message. Uh, not only an amazing message, but it was incredibly convicting um, by Pastor D. I know I myself was convicted, so I hope that you as well have been convicted to go and um, make change to the way that you're doing life right now. So um, with today being Father's Day, one of the most important things that we can do as fathers is to inspire our children. Um, and sometimes doing that, we try to do it on our own, and sometimes we miss the mark, and we need a little help. Um, the best help that you can get is from God. So how do we get this help from God? How do we access it? The best way that you can access this help from God is to become a Christian. And you just need three simple things, right? One, just need to believe that you yourself are not perfect, that you're a sinner, that sometimes you mess up and you miss the mark. Two, believe that God is who he said he is. Um, and three, just believe that he lived a sinless life, that he died, and that he's coming back again. Just those three things, just that simple. Um, if you do this, then you are now a Christian. So if you're interested in becoming a Christian for the very first time, just go ahead and pray this prayer with me. Dear God, I thank you for loving me. I thank you for always having my best interests at heart. God, I know that sometimes I miss the mark. I know that I am imperfect. And God, I need your help, not only now, but God, throughout the rest of my life. I need you to walk with me. I need you to be my guide. Lord, I love you and I praise you. Amen. So if you made that prayer, or if you say that, said that prayer, then guess what? You're a Christian. And we here at City Point would like to know. Best way for us to know is for you to text BELIEVER to 64600. Once you text that, you'll get a link sent to you with some information where you can kick back to us. And then we can start this road as Christians together. And then if you also just need someone to pray for you, you can also text BELIEVER to 64600. And we will begin praying for you right there on the spot, no matter how big or small that you may feel that it is. And then lastly, we all know that Going through life is hard, and sometimes we need help just right here on earth, right? Um, we here at City Point, we would love to rock out this Christian life with you. So the best way to do that, um, if you're interested in becoming a member here at the dopest church on the planet, go to the church website, citypointcc.org, click on the membership tab, tapity tap, 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 and guess what? Once you submit that information, we're going to be rocking out life together, all right? Love you. Yo, thank you all so much. This is the end of our service. Thank you for tuning in with us. There are tons of spaces and places uh, to get absolutely great preaching and singing and worship experience uh, virtually, but you decided to tune in to us, and I deeply appreciated that. Thank you to all of you that are our visitors. Thank you for those that are a part of the City Point community that invited people out that share the link to today's service. Thank you for doing that. Because you're doing that, our community continues to grow even while we are connected virtually. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope that you guys have a phenomenal week. I will be praying for you. We do every single night in my house, pray for you, and uh, hope that God continues to keep you and protect you. And so until next time, peace.